So, uh, yeah, happy Super Tuesday. Uh, how's it going out there? Yeah, <laughs> okay. Uh, so I wanna thank my friend Sue Tinder for asking me to do this series. I initially was reluctant to do it um, for a couple of reasons. One it's, is that it's my area of scholarship and I didn't want to inflict that on people innocently. Uh, so I'm glad you came out. The other is that this area is very fraught, um, studying native cultures. And um, I knew how to handle that, I thought, uh, and I wasn't sure if, anyway, it's just fraught. And so I wanted to do it right, and I wanted to be careful about it. And so how do you do that? <clears throat> Well, it's actually, while it's fraught, it's actually pretty simple to study native cultures. It just requires you recognizing a few things. First of all, you're on their land. Um, and I know that seems kind of obvious, but um, it's one thing to kind of know it up here. It's one thing to kind of practice it through your scholarship and through your reading, that you're on their land. And of course, land is for native people what, I don't know, the, the word is for Western cultures, or, or I'm not sure there's an equivalent, <clears throat> but whatever generates your identity, uh, whether it's your job or your family or your gender or whatever, for native people, it is land. And so to have that land taken or to be removed from that land uh, or to, to be removed from the living, um, as happened often in California, um, it is a loss that we can only try to imagine. Because again, the identity of Native people comes from the land. And so if you take that away, you've taken everything pretty much um, and that is the history of Euro-American and Native peoples is that um, we did this um, uh, my ancestors and probably some of yours did this they came in they took the land uh, which as I said was um, okay uh, that happened but it's what well, and you'll see some of this and when we talk about these writers, it was a very different thing depending on your perspective. Americans, Euro-Americans were operating via any number of myths, including the, the Genesis myth of creation, which, by the way, you're going to see these writers engage uh, in very interesting and profound and provocative ways. And also America's own myth of manifest destiny that that God and fate had decreed that we would connect the oceans with our empire or nation. Um, that is the history. Um, and if, if we want to study native cultures, we need to see through the lens of that history because that's what they're doing, uh, understandably. Now it's a cruel twist of ideology that, uh, that once we, Euro-Americans, again, I want to be careful with my words here, decimated the nations that were indigenous to this continent, decimated but not destroyed, because most of them, most of them are still here. Most native people live in cities, in fact, and there's a historical reason for that. Um, we decided once they were gone that we loved them and that we loved their culture. <laughs> and so we thought we'd take that too. <laughs> and uh, we have. And so that is yet another offense um, to Native people and you see it all the time. Still the most stupid and egregious example is the Washington Redskins, which is just, you know, really, do we have to call them that? I mean, and apparently we do, according to their fans and their owner. 
Um, but there's also more apparently benign uses of appropriation. Um, like this series could be that, <laughs> if we're not careful, where we simply lift, not simply, but we lift the wisdom from these native cultures and adopt it for ourselves without understanding land history and the history of appropriation. So I know you won't do that, but uh, I want to put that out there as something we need to be careful of because it happens all the time, all the time. Uh, for example, you can probably tell when it's happening <clears throat> by the way people talk about it. So, for example, someone says, Native American cultures believed X. Okay, um, that could come from a good place, that could be well-meaning, but you, if you understand the history, you understand that Native, even Native Americans, that concept is a colonial concept. Because they never looked at each other and said, what's up, Native American? What's up, Indian? They were different. They were Apache and, and, um, and Kiowa. They were Laguna Pueblo and Navajo, and they didn't see a lot in common. Um, you know, they were different. They saw some things in common, but they were not all the same. And that move, that move of making them all the same, of making them Indians, that's a powerful colonial move that comes right out, right out of the diaries of Cristobal Colon, who we know as Christopher Columbus, <clears throat> who's, who called them Indians because he was lost. <laughs> he, he thought they were Asian Indians. Um, all right, so appropriation. Now, why do this then? If it's so fraught, why do it? Because Native people are speaking they're speaking to us and they have things to say. And these things come from their unique relationship to the land and to this colonial history. Uh, and they have a wisdom that comes from, again, those sources that is different from the Western traditions. And it's worth listening to them. So um, when I, present or write on Native issues, uh, literature mainly, I always try to frame it as an act of listening because this is good storytelling, right? It's storytelling context is when the storyteller starts, you, you respond and you encourage her. Or at the end, you, you say, that was a great story, what about this? So this would be an act of listening and I don't mean that naively or romantically, I mean, we need to hear, and to hear, we need to respond with questions and observations, etc. Sherman Alexie, a Coeur um, member of the Coeur Nation, says, um, you can tell uh, when white people do this because they say that our values are universal. Universal, he says, means white people understand it. Uh, and he's right. Um, these are not universal values. Or if they are, we've got to start from where they begin, which is in the landscape. Um, universal, calling this universal, deprives it of its, what Joseph Campbell called its ethnic notion, its base in land and language which as you'll see is incredibly important to native people. Calling it universal just rips it out of that context and says, oh, it's like the Vedas. You know, it might be like the Vedas, but you've got to do this other stuff first, you know? You've got to hear it in its own voice. And that's our effort for the next six weeks, and I thank you for joining me on it. Now, let's get to this amazing woman, Zikala Shah, um, who, was, who gave herself that name in her teens. Who does that? I guess some teenagers do that. Um, her name means Red Bird in Dakota. And she was born February 22, 1876, 
on the Yankton Sioux Agency in South Dakota. Uh, I'll show you exactly where and talk about her people in a moment. She died January 26, 1938 in Washington, D.C., buried in Arlington Cemetery, interestingly enough. She had a Euro-American father and a fierce, as you will hear, fierce Yankton Sioux mother. At age eight, and we'll hear this story in her own words, she was taken to, well, she actually wanted to go to White's Manual Labor Institute. <laughs> wow, that does not bear up well, does it? <laughs> Over time, White's Manual Labor Institute at age eight. Uh, this is a Quaker missionary school in Wabash, Indiana. Not South Dakota, right? She returned to live with her mother in 1887, but left again three years later. Um, and she studied there piano and violin, uh, among other things. Graduated from the Institute in 1895. And when she received her diploma, uh, this was in the day of great oratory, she was expected to give a speech and she gave a speech advocating for women's rights. 1895, a Yankton Sioux woman in a Quaker school gave a speech advocating for women's rights. Um, <clears throat> they renamed her Gertrude Simmons. Um, I know, right? <laughs> Apologies to Gertrude's out there, but it doesn't have the sound of zikkala, right? Um, Gertrude Simmons, this was a common thing. Um, you're going to hear a lot, probably, in other talks and discussions about the boarding school system. And it was utter genius in its power to strip people of a culture. Y you'll hear her experience of this. They cut, her, they cut their hair, they changed their clothes, they forbid them speaking their native language. Um, and they renamed them. I mean, honestly, that's been one of the most powerful moves in the history of all cultures is to rename yourself, sure, but when you are renamed by someone else in power, that's incredibly devastating. You've lost something, especially when your name means Redbird, right? You've lost something when you go to Gertrude Simmons. Uh, let's see, she graduated from, um, yeah, oh, right, she graduated from the Institute in 1895, then she goes to Earlham College in Richmond, Indiana, another Quaker school, and she graduates from there in 1897. Again, she was a unique woman, she stood out even among her peers, her white peers, excelled academically, academically was brilliant orator and writer, as you'll see. Uh, she gave a prize-winning speech at a statewide oratorical contest. Um, and in fact, she writes about this in her work where um, she was terrified, of course, and then um, hears this thunderous applause when they give out the awards and she can't quite process that they'd given it to her, uh, but they had. Um, it was at Earlham College that she began to collect stories from all other native tribes, from other native tribes, not all of them, uh, recognizing that they were now in this colonial relationship to each other where they were all Indians. Um, and, and this too was a fascinating move to collect these stories. Uh, and you'll get to hear some of them and we'll talk more about them. Uh, she also translated these stories, whether they were uh, Lakota, Dakota, Nakota, which is her people, or Apache or whatever. She translated them into English, which is how we're gonna read them, but also Latin. She translated them into Latin. I love that. Um, in 1897, just six weeks before she was going to graduate, she had to leave Earlham 
because of financial and health issues. And she returned to the reservation. Uh, I'm sorry, she didn't return to the reservation this time. Instead, she moved to Boston, where she enrolled in the New England Conservatory of Music and uh, advanced her piano and violin playing. The Indianapolis News in 1897 described her, quote, a cultivated young woman whose pronunciation was without a trace of tongue unfamiliar with English, unquote. Not sure that could have been said of me as a teenager. <laughs> All right, then she goes to 1899. She goes to Carlisle Indian School. We may hear this name uh, again. Carlisle was uh, an industrial Indian school in Pennsylvania. And from 1879 to 1918, this was the flagship Indian boarding school. Again, native children were taken, sometimes by force, sometimes by persuasion, from their families <clears throat> and shipped off to these boarding schools. Again, Zikala Shah does this at eight. Uh, sometimes it was younger, sometimes it was older, but the, the reason was that the United States, this is after Wounded Knee, this is after 1890, when the prevailing opinion in the United States was that the Indian Wars had been won. And so now what do we do? What do we do with these people? Well, first thing we do is we take their land, take what's left that we haven't taken already. And then we've got to make them white. And so, again, it's, the genius is brutal here. You get the children, you know, because the older people have seen and know a way of life that is not this new American way of life. And so they're gonna be harder to convert uh, and to, to make docile. Uh, you get the children who are impressionable, shall we say, um, and you strip them of their language, take them away from their land, and um, dress them as white students. Um, it was, Carlisle Indian School was used as a model for the other Indian schools like Sherman School and some of the others. Um, and in 1900, um, she began she was a music teacher there. They sent her back to the Yankton Re Reservation to gather more students. So see what's happening here. She's, she wants to go at eight. Her mother is heartbroken about this and tries to convince her not to go, but eventually lets her go. And it's hard. We're going to hear about how hard it was. But she also succeeds. I mean, she won that contest, she won a couple contests. She's a brilliant musician, she's a brilliant writer and speaker. There's this, there's this element of success here. There's an element of, hey, you know, this kind of sucked, but now I can do it. And so uh, that's one reason she went to Carlisle as a teacher, because that was the place to be. And of course, part of her duties, simply as a music teacher, was to go and get more Native children, Yankton children. And so she goes back in 1900, and she is shocked by what she sees. Her home is falling apart. Um, the poverty is heartbreaking. And there was a treaty signed in 1858 that we'll talk about. And that treaty has been broken in just a few decades, and so white people are living on Dakota land, right in the midst of the remaining Dakota people. Um, so she goes back to Carlisle and starts her writing career. She starts writing about Native American life. And her goal is to depict Native people her own and others, because now we're in this colonial ideology where we're all the same, to depict them in a way that she knows, instead of the racist way that had, was dominant in the public sphere 
in the United States. Stupid, dirty, um, wild savages, right? Um, those are not the people she knows. And so she, this, this, this is brilliant. Um, it's a brilliant counter to a brilliant and devastating move on the part of the United States is to say, oh, well, let me, let me share you, with you some of my stories that I've gathered. It's an act of sur subversion, as well as repatriation of stories. And again, we'll get to that. Um, so in these stories, she, she just tells the stories she knew growing up, stories she's heard from other people that do not include the racist stereotypes or depicting Native people as ignorant savages. <clears throat> Her writing became deeply critical of the boarding school system, uh, again, which she experienced beginning at eight. And she began publishing these stories in national magazines like the Atlantic Monthly and Harper's. Now, I know it's hard to imagine a culture that gets its intellectual um, information and discourse from a magazine, like a print magazine. But in the 19th century, early 20th century especially, Harper's and the Atlantic Monthly, those were where the intelligentsia went to learn about the world, especially America. Uh, and both of those magazines are still going, by the way, and they have really interesting archives that you can access, uh, where you can get to see some of this writing. And in fact, she wrote these stories, and, and this is um, American Indian stories. They're, it's basically, the book is basically these essays she wrote for The Atlantic and Harper's. Um, in 1901, she writes a piece for Harper's <clears throat> about the profound loss of identity she experienced at uh, the Carlisle Indian School where she was a teacher. She was fired. In 1902, she marries Raymond Teleface Bonin, and so you may see her name as Gertrude Bonin, or Gertrude Simmons Bonin. She writes the libretto for the Sundance, an opera, uh, 1913, the only, the, sorry, not the only, the first Native American opera. Now, if you know anything about Sundance, you know that this is a plains ceremony that's that is their ceremony. It's the most profound ceremony among the Plains tribes that involves um, actually piercing your skin and tying um, yourself to this pole, this lodge pole, and leaning back and staring at the sun. And the skin pulls out and it's painful, but it's an act of deep meditation and sacrifice to the sun. She made an opera of that, which is amazing, and um, co-read it with William F. Hansen, and uh, premiered in Vernal, Utah, in 1913, and eventually was shown in 1938 at the New York Light Opera Guild. Interesting. She also uh, joins the Society of the American Indian, in 1916, she becomes the secretary for that. And so she and her husband moved to Washington, D.C., uh, where she functions as, what, a kind of bureaucrat? Uh, maybe that's not quite right. She was the liaison between the Society of the American Indian and the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And if you know about the BIA, that is the federal government's arm hand that reaches into Native people's lives. Um, she edited American Indian Magazine, 1918 to 1919. Um, <laughs> under the name Gertrude Bonin, she writes this political, what, um, political tract arguing about the treatment of Oklahoma's Indians, and it has one of those wonderful early 20th century titles, Oklahoma's Poor Indians, an orgy of graft and exploitation of the five civilized tribes, legalized robbery <laughs> in 1924. I'm going to read you some of that, too, as we go along. Um, 
She founded the National Council of American Indians in 1926 and advocated for citizenship for Native people. I know, <laughs> what kind of irony is that? Uh, Native people got the vote tacitly, uh, formally in 1924, but like other disenfranchised people did not really get it until the 60s. Uh, she argued for better education, uh, improved health care, cultural recognition, and preservation. Interestingly, she argued against the use of peyote in, uh, even in native ceremonies because she thought um, native people needed not have that that tag around their necks as they were trying to assimilate into white culture of using hallucinogenics. This is not generally the position of native people, especially in the Southwest, who find peyote to be an essential part of their ceremonial life. And then she was appointed to the Miriam Commission in 1928. Um, that was a government commission to look into some of these abuse, abuses she wrote about in the Oklahoma Poor tract and uh, actually saw some reforms. Um, and she was a fierce advocate for Native people until her death. All right, so there's a brief biography of this amazing woman. And you can see already the trajectory she went through, and we'll get into it a little deeper, but I thought this was interesting. I came across this in the research. The Carlisle Indian School was where she taught. Remember, it was the boarding school that was the model for all the other Indian boarding schools at the time. And she was their prize teacher, uh, a woman who could write Latin, play violin, play piano, speak with great erudition. And when she began to speak of her own experiences, this is what they said. All that Zikalasa has in the way of literary ability and culture she owes to the good people who from time to time have taken her into their homes and hearts and given her aid. Yet not a word of gratitude or allusion to such kindness on the part of her friends has ever escaped any line of anything she has ever written for the public. By this course she injures herself and harms the educational work in progress for the race from which she sprang. In a list of Indians we have in mind, some of whom have reached higher altitudes in literary and professional lines than Zikala Shah, we know of no other case of such pro pronounced morbidness. Right? You should be grateful that we took your culture and gave you ours. Um, so much in that rhetoric still prevails, right? Let's talk briefly about her people. The Yangtanwan Dakota Oyate. Oyate means the people. Uh, originally, you can see the location there in South Dakota. Originally over 11 million acres, they roamed. Native people didn't have property. They just had hunting grounds or places they lived. Um, <clears throat> there is a great story here about Lewis and Clark. Uh, going through the Yankton land. They learn, this is not in the journals of Lewis and Clark, it's a local legend that is still told. I, I read an interview with the current chief of the Yankton Sioux and he told this story too. Meriwether Lewis uh, learns that a male child had been born near their encampment uh, there in South Dakota, southeastern South Dakota on the Missouri River. And so he sent for the child and wrapped the newborn boy in an American flag. And um, he declared the baby an American. This is 1804. The boy grew up to become struck by the re, a Yankton Sioux chief, although the journals mention nothing of this. So interestingly, um, Struck by the re comes back to, comes back. He grows up to sign the treaty, the Yankton Treaty of 1858. How interesting. Um, 
So by the late 1850s, there was much pressure to open up south, southeastern South Dakota to white settlement. Struck by the Ree uh, and several other chiefs head to D.C. in late 1857 to negotiate the treaty with the federal government. They work on it for three and a half months. And Struck by the Ree names, name appears on the first treaty of Washington signed April 19th. 1858. Returning from Washington, struck by the re, told his people who, you know, that we see this in the history. It's not like, you know, there's dissension among the tribes about what to do with this colonial encroachment. And some people want to, want to say, hey, let's just make the best of it. Actually, Black Elk will call these hang around the fort Indians because <laughs> they're always hanging around the fort see if they can get some food and get some money. And then there are the resistors, like Sitting Bull and Geronimo, whose name was Goyathle. Um, <clears throat> he comes back and he kind of has to explain this to his people and he says, like, he says this, listen, the white men are coming in like maggots. It is useless to resist them. There are many more than we are. We could not hope to stop them Many of our brave warriors would be killed and our women and children left in sorrow. And still we would not stop them. We must accept it, get the best terms we can get and try to adopt their ways. And in fact, that was the federal government's policy um, through the Dawes Act, which we can talk about uh, if you want, around this uh, late 19th century um, and, and works perfectly with the boarding school uh, movement, which is to take Native children out of their homes and, well, you know, also we'll take the land too, by the way, um, and basically eliminate Native cultures, eliminate them. So they begin with 11 million acres at their disposal. They end up with 475,000 acres um, for $1.6 million to be paid over 50 years. Um, they're supposed to do a bunch of stuff. The federal government is supposed to provide X, Y, and Z. They never do. Uh, in fact, they move in on the land that is, by treaty, belongs to the Yankton Sioux. And then there was another chief named Smutty Bear who argues with strike the re, um, he opposed the treaty. He didn't want them to sign it over. He thought it would bring further aggression and further encroachment, and of course he was right. Um, and this is a dilemma that repeats itself over and over throughout native um, white interaction. A man named Charles F. Picote, a speculator, a business venturist, and a translator for these meetings, was given 640 acres for his trouble. Currently, there are about 9,000 Yankton Sioux um, and 3,400 or live on or about the reservation. So that's not that unusual. Most Native people do not live on reservations now. I like this. They created the Dakota One app uh, which is a real thing, I looked it up, um, to help young people maintain the Dakota language. And so there's an app for that. All right, let's get to Zikalasha. So her first book is Old Indian Legends in 1901. And again, this is that book where she says, well, let me gather some stories for you. And... Um, you know, I'll put them together in this book and uh, you can learn about my people. But these stories, I don't know. <laughs> these are a little, they have a little edge to them, let's just say. Let me, let me share a few with you. So the first half of the book is Iktomi stories. Iktomi is grandmother spider who is a trickster. Hmm. Okay, so there is Iktomi and the Ducks. And if you know trickster tales, you'll recognize the format. If you don't, this is a trickster 
format, especially on this continent. Iktomi befriends a group of dancing ducks and tricks them into playing music and having them dance in a certain way that makes them twist their necks and breaks them, breaks their own necks, which kills the ducks. Ah, Iktomi's happy now. He takes the ducks back to his teepee and he cooks them and then he hears a tree cracking in the wind and he goes to investigate. He breaks the limb that cracks but gets stuck by it. Classic Iktomi. And a group of wolves comes along and eats the ducks. Ik, uh, Iktomi, as a trickster, is a teacher by bad example. Okay? You might know of Coyote or Raven or Hermes. Um, there is Iktomi's blanket. He's hungry and he needs food. Tricksters are always hungry, always in need. Um, and this is because, you know, he had those ducks and now he's, he doesn't get the ducks. Um, so he prays to Inyan, the great grandfather, to bless him with meat. And Iktomi offers Inyan his blanket and uh, upon returning from his prayer and his offering, Iktomi comes across a wounded deer. His prayers are answered. So he builds a fire and cooks the deer meat. <clears throat> but while doing so, he grows so cold, but he gave away his blanket, right? So uh, he had nothing to put on. He goes back to get his blanket, and upon return, he sees that his meat, meat has been eaten and his fire is out. Iktomi realizes he should have eaten the meat first before going to get his blanket. This is another theme of tricksters, is the problems with satisfying immediate needs over more long-term needs or having a broader perspective. This is my favorite story, Iktomi and the Fawn. And it goes on and on and on, and I'm not gonna do that to you, but let, let me see if I can reduce it down. Iktomi comes across a beautiful peacock in a tree, and he says, I wish I could be as beautiful as a peacock. And so he begs the peacock to give him wonderful feathers, like the peacock has. Now the peacock, he's always saying, all these characters are always saying, you don't really want this, you know, because there are, there are catches to all these things. And so, you know, Iktomi is annoying and he, he keeps aggravating the peacock and the peacock says, okay, but you know, there's one thing you can't have. The only condition is that he can't try to fly because peacocks don't really fly. So that's the trade-off, right? Of course, Iktomi sees some birds flying and says, hey, I have feathers, let me try to fly. And now he goes back to being a spider because that was the one condition and he couldn't handle the one condition. He comes across an arrow and again, he's talking to the arrow, and he's like, man, I wish I could be an arrow. That would be awesome. And they're like, well, it's pretty awesome being an arrow, but there are limitations. All right, so you know where this is going. Um, he fails to follow the rule of the arrows and returns again to himself, becomes a spider again. Finally, he comes, and this is all way drawn out. I'm reducing it a lot. <clears throat> He comes across a fawn and asks the fawn <laughs> to give him spots on his nose like the fawn has, okay? Uh, in order to get the spots, Iktomi has to be, <laughs> the fawns are become the tricksters, and I love this, fawns as tricksters, right? They say, well, listen, the way we got our spots is we burned them on our face. We put coals on our faces, that's how we, and Iktomi is an idiot, and he doesn't question this at all. And so he's buried in a hole and gets burned. Um, and uh, he climbs out of the fire, because you're supposed to stay in the fire to get the spots, and he climbs out. So he doesn't get anything he desires. And it's because his desires are not appropriate. Now, I don't know about this story, this is one of the, I've, I've read a lot of Native American literature and mythology. I've never read anything quite like this. Dance in a buffalo skull. 
And this is one of those stories where I'm thinking, she, there's a several layers here. And there's a subversive layer. So let me see if I, again, this goes on and on and on. Let me see if I can reduce it down for you. And listen, this will be Zikalashad's language here, so you get a sense of her voice. It was night upon the prairie. Overhead, the stars were twinkling bright, their red and yellow lights. The moon was young. A silvery thread among the stars, it soon drifted low beneath the horizon. Upon the, grant, the ground, the land was pitchy black. There are night people on the plain who love the dark. Amid the black level land, they meet to frolic under the stars. Then when their sharp ears hear any strange footfalls near, they scamper away into the dark shadows of the night. You ever been outside at night, and not near anything? That sounds right. There are, they are safely hid from all dangers, or so they think. Thus it was that one very black night, afar off from the edge of the level land, out of the wooded river bottom, glided forth two balls of fire. They came farther and farther into the level land. They grew larger and brighter. The dark hid the body of the creature with those fiery eyes. They came on and on, just over the tops of the prairie grass. It might have been a wild cat prowling low on soft, stealthy feet. And then a lot happens. Slowly but surely, the terrible eyes drew nearer and nearer to the heart of the level land. There in a huge old buffalo skull was a gay feast and dance. Tiny little field mice were singing and dancing in a circle at the to the boom boom of a wee wee drum. They were la they're in a skull, <laughs> okay. They were laughing and talking among themselves while their chosen singers sing a loud merry tune. They built a small open fire within the center of their queer dance house. The light streamed out of the buffalo skull through all the curious sockets and holes. What an image. A light on the plain in the middle of the night was an unusual thing. But so merry were the mice that they did not hear the king, king of sleepy birds disturbed by the unaccustomed fire. A pack of wolves, fearing to come nigh this night fire, stood together a little distance away and turning their pointed noses to the stars, howled and yelped most dismally. Even the cry of the wolves was unheeded by the mice within the lighted buffalo skull. They were feasting and dancing, they were singing and laughing, those funny little furry fellows. All the while across the dark from out the low river bottom came that pair of fiery eyes, now closer and more swift, now fiercer and more glaring. The eyes moved toward the buffalo skull. All unconscious of these fearful eyes, the happy mice nibbled at dried roots and venison. The singers had started another song. The drummers beat the time, turning their heads from side to side in rhythm. In a ring around the fire hopped the mice, each bouncing hard on his two hind feet. Some carried their tails over their arms, while others trailed them proudly along. Ah, the very near are those round yellow eyes. Low to the ground they seem to creep, creep toward the buffalo skull. All of a sudden they slide into the eye sockets of the old skull. Spirit of the buffalo, squeaked a frightened mouse. That's what he said. Um, as he jumped out from a hole in the back part of the skull, a cat, a cat, cried the other mice as they scrambled out of the holes, both large and snug. Noiseless, they ran away into the dark. End of story. Hmm. Okay, a metaphor for native people, maybe. Uh, not recognizing the danger, the alien danger that's coming toward them. I don't know. It's a good story, though. So here is American Indian stories. Um, so 1921, again, this is the um, anthology, really, of the stories she published in The Atlantic and Harper's. So again, let me let you hear her voice. 
It's broken into sections, and this is Impressions of an Indian Childhood, specifically my mother. Her mother plays a very prominent role in her life, as was often the case um, in Plains Tribes peoples. Again, this is a direct quote. A wigwam of weather-stained canvas stood at the base of some irregularly ascending hills. A footpath wound its way gently down the sloping land till it reached the broad river bottom, creeping through the long swamp grasses that bent over it on either side. It came out on the edge of the Missouri. And you saw maybe in some of the photos of the land there that it's right on the Missouri. And if you've ever seen the Missouri, it's kind of overwhelming. It's, it's incredibly large and powerful. Here, morning, noon, and evening, my mother came to draw water from the muddy stream for our household. Always, when my mother started for the river, I stopped my play to run along with her. She was only of medium height. Often she was sad and silent, at, times, at which times her full arched lips were compressed into hard, bitter lines, and shadows fell under her black eyes. Then I clung to her hand and begged to know what made her tears fall. Hush, my little daughter, we must never talk about my tears. And smiling through them, she patted my head and said, now, let me see how fast you can run today. Whereupon I tore away at my highest possible speed with my long black hair blowing in the breeze. I was a wild little girl of seven and here's another move she makes. She adopts the savage, uh, the wild savage persona, in order to subvert it later. Um, I was a wild little girl. And, and then you'll see what wild means. It means running with her mother to the river. Loosely clad in a slip of brown buckskin and light-footed with a pair of soft moccasins on my feet, I was as free as the wind that blew my hair. So to be wild is to be free. And no less spirited than a bounding deer, these were my mother's pride, my wild freedom and overflowing spirits. She taught me no fear, save that of intruding myself upon other people. And she goes on to talk about how it's time, it's storytelling time, and her mother says, go get the others, see if they want to come. And indeed, her greatest fear is to stand at the teepee and then intrude on a conversation. And so often she'll wait, she's dying, she's a little girl, she's dying for storytelling time, but she knows that respect must be paid to the people in their spaces doing their own rituals or stories or just having general conversations. So they, they do arrive. At the arrival of our guest, I sat close to my mother and did not leave her side without first asking her consent. I ate my supper in quiet, listening patiently to the talk of old people, wishing all the time they would begin the stories I loved best. At last, when I could not wait any longer, I whispered in my mother's ear, ask them to tell a Nick Tommy story, mother. Soothing my impatience, my mother said aloud, my little daughter is anxious to hear your legends. By this time we were all through eating and the evening was deepening into twilight. And in each, and each in turn, as each in turn began to tell a legend, I pillowed my head in my mother's lap and lying flat upon my back, I watched the stars as they peeped down upon me one by one. The increasing interest of the tale aroused me, and I sat up eagerly listening for every word. The old women made funny remarks and laughed so heartily that I could not help joining them. Now, is there a little bit of romanticism in that? No doubt. But did it happen that way? No doubt. She's writing in Western discourse, and she knows it and there's a purpose to it. And she does want, I feel comfortable saying, she does want to counter the prevailing notion of her people as wild, savage, ignorant, uh, and dangerous. How dangerous is it? They're, they're sitting around telling stories. Um, and then here is the account of the Quaker missionaries coming to their village. From some of my playmates, I had heard that two pale-faced, let's see, she's, 
It was in my eighth year in the month of March. She says I learned afterwards, because she doesn't know what March is. From some of my playmates, I learned that two pale-faced missionaries were in our, our village. They were from that class of white men who wore big hats and carried large hearts. They said, they said they carried large hearts. Running direct to my mother, I began to question her why these two strangers were among us. She told me, after I had teased much, that they had come to take away Indian boys and girls to the east. My mother did not seem to want me to talk about them, but in a day or two I gleaned many wonderful stories from my playfellows concerning the strangers. Mother, my friend Judwin is going home with the missionaries. She's going to a more beautiful country than ours. The pale faces told her so. I said wistfully, wishing in my heart that I might go too. And then there's back and forth with her mother that probably similar to most, to many mother-daughter conversations about a young daughter wanting to do something and a mother not wanting her to do. She continues, my heart thumps so hard against my breast. I wonder if my mother could hear it. Did he tell them to take me, mother? I asked, fearing lest Dahi had forbidden the pale faces to see me and that my hope of going to the Wonderland would be entirely blighted. With a sad, slow smile, she answered, there, I knew you were wishing to go because Judwin has filled your ears with the white men's lies. Don't believe a word they say. Their words are sweet, but my child, their deeds are bitter. You will cry for me, but they will not soothe you. Stay with me, my little one. Your brother Dawi says that going east away from your mother is too hard an experience for his baby sister. So the missionaries tell young Zikala Shah that there are apples back in the east that are unlike anything they've ever seen or known. Judwin had told me of the great tree where grew red, red apples and how we could reach our hands out and pick all the red apples we wanted. I had never seen apple trees. I'd never tasted more than a dozen red apples in my life. And when I hear of orchards of the east, I was eager to roam among them. The missionary smiled into my eyes and patted my head, and I wondered how mother could say such hard words against them. Mother, ask them if little girls may have all the red apples they want when they go east, I whispered aloud in my excitement. The interpreter heard me and answered, yes, little girl. The nice red apples are for those who pick them, and you will have a ride on the iron horse if you go with these good people. I'd never seen a train, and he knew it. Mother, I'm going east. I like big red apples, and I want to ride on the iron horse. Mother, please say yes. My mother said nothing. The missionaries waited in silence and my eyes began to blur with tears, though I struggled to choke them back. The corners of my mouth twitched and my mother saw me. I am not ready to give you any word, she said to the missionaries. Tomorrow I shall send my answer by my son. They wait for the night. Zikala is begging her mother to go. Her mother says, Sorry, her aunt, her mother's sister, comes by and says, let her try it. And encourages her to go. And, um, and so she does. Um, let me see if I can give you the scene here. I walked to the, so they go. I walked with my mother to the carriage that was soon to take us to the iron horse. I was happy. I met my playmates, who were also wearing their best thick blankets. Soon we were being drawn rapidly away by the white man's horses. When I saw the lonely figure of my mother vanish in the distance, a sense of regret settled heavily upon me. I felt suddenly weak, as if I might fall to the limp to the ground. I was in the hands of strangers whom my mother did not fully trust. I no longer felt free to be myself or to voice my own feelings. The tears trickled down my cheeks 
and I buried my face in the folds of my blanket. Now the first step parting me from my mother was taken and all my belated tears availed nothing. So American Indian Stories is again a kind of autobiography. So the next chapter here is the school days of an Indian girl. And oh my goodness, we've got an hour already. So let me see if I can speed up here. Uh, she describes in that brilliant way of writing she has the trip and various interactions um, with the people at the boarding school. Let's talk about the cutting of her hair. She is confused by what she calls eventually the iron routine of the boarding school where eating was at a certain time and bedtime was at a certain time. Um, late in the morning, uh, she says, my friend Judwin gave me a terrible warning. Judwin knew a few words of English and she had overheard the pale faced woman talk about cutting our long, heavy hair. Our mothers had taught us that only unskilled warriors who were captured by their hair shingled by the, uh, had their hair shingled by the enemy. So this cutting of the hair represented a kind of defeat. And among our people, short hair was worn by mourners and cut hair by cowards. We discussed our fate for a while and then Judwin said, we have to submit because they are strong. No, I will not submit. I will struggle first, she said. So she watches the other children's hair being cut. And then it's her turn. I cried aloud, shaking my head all the while until I felt the cold blades of scissors against my neck and heard them gnaw off one of my thick braids. Then I lost my spirit. Since the day I was taken from my mother, I'd I had suffered extreme indignities. People had stared at me. I had been tossed about in the air like a wooden puppet. That's one of the passages I just skipped. A woman comes out of nowhere, picks her up, and throws her up in the air. I mean, what are you supposed to do with that? She's eight. And now my long hair was cut like a coward's. In my anguish, I moaned for my mother, but no one came to comfort me. Not a soul reasoned quiet with, quietly with me as my own mother used to do. For now, I was only one of many little animals driven by a herder. There is the snow episode where they go out to make uh, figures in the snow. And Judwin knows just enough English to say, to say, look, if they tell you something, no. Just say no. I mean, that's a word you can learn, no. Um, and so they are captured <laughs> for making these snow figures. And um, <clears throat> one of the children, uh, the school mistress says, are you going to listen to me when I tell you what to do? No. And they just slap her around. And then finally, the school mistress changes the questions. Uh, are you going to behave badly again? No. Doesn't matter. Oh, that's the only word they know. And so their punishment and relief is based on this um, use of the one English word. There's the iron routine she talks about. And then here is her retrospection, a section called retrospection. At this stage of my own evolution, I was ready to curse men of small capacity for being the dwarfs their God had made them. In the process of my education, I had lost all consciousness of the nature world around me. Thus, when a hidden rage took me to a, the small white-walled prison, which I then called my room, I unknowingly turned away from my one salvation. Alone in my room, I sat like the petrified Indian woman of whom my mother used to tell me. I wished my heart's burdens would turn me into unfeeling stone, but alive in my tomb I was destitute. For the white men's papers, I had given up my faith in the Great Spirit. For these same papers, I had forgotten the healing in trees and in books. On account of my mother's simpler, simple view of life and my lack of any, I gave her up also. I made no friends among the race of people I loathed. Like a slender tree, I'd been uprooted from my mother, my nature, and my God. 
I was shorn of my branches, which had waved in sympathy and love for home and friends, the natural coat of bark, which had protected my oversensitive nature, was scraped off to the very quick. Now a cold, bare pole I seemed to be, planted in a strange earth. Still, I seemed to hope a day would come when my mute, aching head, reared upward to the sky, would flash a zigzag lightning across the heavens with this dream for a long pent consciousness. I walked again among the crowds. So yeah, I think she, uh, she learned English. Beautiful. And here is a further turning point for her, an epiphany. At last, one we weary day in the schoolroom. Um, th this was uh, at Carlisle, so this is much later. One weary day in the schoolroom, a new idea, idea presented itself to me. It was a new way of solving the problem of my inner self. Okay, we know about that. I liked it. Thus, I resigned my position as teacher, and now I am in an eastern city, following the long course of study I have set for myself. Now, as I look, that was DC. Now, as I look back upon the recent past, I see it from a distance right? As a whole, I remember how from morning till evening many specimens of civilized peoples visited the Indian school. The city folks with canes and eyeglasses, the countrymen with sunburnt cheeks and clumsy feet, forgot their relative social ranks in an ignorant curiosity. Both sorts of these Christian pale faces were alike astounded at seeing the children of savage warriors so docile and industrious. As answers to their shallow inquiries, they received the student's sample work to look upon, examining the neatly figured pages and gazing upon the Indian girls and boys bending over their books. The white visitors walked out of the schoolhouse well satisfied. They were educating the children of the red man. They were paying a liberal fee to the government employees in whose able hands lay the small forest of Indian timber. In this fashion, many have passed idly through the Indian schools during the last decade, afterward to boast of their charity to the North American Indian. But few there are who have paused to question whether real life or long-lasting death lies beneath this semblance of civilization. What does she believe? She believes in the great spirit, Wakantanka. When the spirit swells in my breast, I love to roam leisurely among the green hills, or sometimes sitting on the brink of the murmuring Missouri. I marvel at the great blue overhead. With half-closed eyes, I watch the huge cloud shadows in their noiseless play upon the high bluffs opposite me while into my ear rippled the sweet, soft cadences of the river's song. Folded hands lie in my lap, for the time forgot. My heart and I lie small upon the earth. I love that line. My heart and I lie small upon the earth, like a grain of throbbing sand. Drifting clouds and tinkling waters together with the warmth of a genial summer day bespeak with eloquence the loving mystery the loving mystery round about us. During the idol while I sat upon the sunny river bank, I grew somewhat, though my response be not so clearly manifest as in the green grass fringing the edge of the high bluff back of me. Isn't that beautiful? Incredible? Um, so I'm gonna, sorry. What, what you should do is go to the bookstore and buy American Indian stories, and you will not be disappointed by any page or paragraph in this book. It is this kind of writing. So also thought Helen Keller, who wrote her, Dear Zakala Shah, I thank you for your book on Indian legends. I have read them with exquisite pleasure. Like all folk tales, they mirror the child life of the world there is in them a note of wild, strange music. You have translating them into our language in a way that will keep them alive in the hearts of men. 
They are so young, so fresh, so full of the odors of the virgin forest, untrod by the foot of white men. The thoughts of your people seem dipped in the colors of the rainbow, palpitant with the play of the winds, eerie with the thrill of a spirit world unseen but felt and feared. Your tales of birds, beasts, tree, and spirit cannot but hold the captive hearts of all children. That's another thing she did. She kind of marketed this as children's stories, which they are, but you saw. They will kindle in their young minds that eternal wonder which creates poetry and keeps life fresh and eager. I wish you and your little book of Indian tales all success. I am always sincerely your friend, Helen Keller. So this is, <laughs> this is her political tract, which I will uh, skip. Um, but she can switch genres and speak eloquently in the language of bureaucracy. Uh, and there's some amazing, frankly, stories in here. Um, like this third bullet here. To the grafters, the quick and the dead are all the same. On one occasion, they waited literally at the bedside of a dying woman and hardly had the breath left her body when her thumb was pressed upon an ink pad an impression made from it on an alleged will, which was later offered for probate, given to the government. Um, photographers like Joseph Kelly and um, the woman Gertrude Casebeer, uh, who's an interesting case in herself, uh, I learned. Uh, you should look her up. They found something um, photographic, imagistic in Gertrude uh, Bonin, Zikala Shah. What is the wisdom of Zikala Shah? First of all, I think it's wonder. It's that sense of childish wonder that was never lost for her. A wonder at simply being alive. Uh, a wonder at being a part of something bigger, like the planet. And so there is the wonder of nature to, uh, again, nature forms her identity until she is taken away, away from that nature and given an identity by the missionaries. There is all along this sense of openness, this sense of openness to understanding, to understanding the English language, to understanding Western music, learning how to play it, learning how to speak this language that is not her own, to the point where she wins the acclaim of her white peers and they give her an award that requires an openness and also survival. Um, once, once we're past that scene that I read to you, where she realizes that the boarding school is doing this to her, everything else she wrote or did was about the survival of herself, uh, not even herself. She's talking about her people, and now her people are Indians because that's the, the group that they've been put into, and so she writes on behalf of Oklahoma natives as well. Resistance. <clears throat> you cannot separate survival and resistance for native people. And in fact, there's an, an amazing literary critic named Gerald Visner who just compounds these words and he says Native American writing is about survivance because survival and resistance go hand in hand. Sherman Alexie, whom I quoted earlier, says Liter literature equals anger times the imagination. <laughs> beauty never loses her sense of beauty whether it's in her plains in South Dakota or in the language of the conquerors, of the colonials. She, she seeks, seeks and sees beauty everywhere. And there is also an, an, a powerful sense of wholeness about her vision of the world that includes the colonial enterprise. It includes the people who took her away. And you'll see if you read her work, she recognizes that even her even her colonial teachers, even the people at Carlisle Indian School who defame her, 
even the people, even her native brethren who try to get her to convert to Christianity, and they do so in very suspicious and dishonest ways, even they, even they are part of this wholeness. And she never, ever falls into uh, dismissing people's humanity. She never does that, that I've read. Um, it just isn't consistent with her vision and the rest of these wonderful qualities. I've gone way over. Thank you for your patience and your attention. Thank you so much. Hey, Jason.